couple other people joining. Um, okay, Sasha, I think we could probably get started. Excellent. Thank you, Becky. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Although it does feel like it's six o'clock at night. <laughs> My name is uh, Sasha Beyonds. I use she, her, AS pronouns. I'm the Associate Director of Equity Initiatives at Planned Parenthood League in Massachusetts, and also a part of the Community Health Improvement Plan uh, design team, as well as a uh, work group uh, for wellness and prevention team um, in Springfield. And I'm so happy to be here to share space with you all. Um, and to see you, uh, even if just virtually. Uh, I uh, just wanted to kind of um, uh, open the space uh, by first just acknowledging everyone uh, showing up in whatever capacity they can uh, and are right now when we talk about equity as a whole, um, especially in spaces, uh, multi-faceted space like this um just want to name and recognize that people are, are showing up in different ways uh and wanting to remind folks that as we talk about equity and we lift up the importance of that in our work that we're intentional and also taking care of our whole selves as well uh so we're able to show up as our full authentic self so please remember to take care of yourself whatever that means for you as becky mentioned you know turning off your camera if you need to making sure you stay hydrated uh, and so also wanting to name that with the feedback of my peers and colleagues, um, the kind of long and the short of it, uh, when we talk about equity, right, we, we don't know what we don't know. And this is a journey that we are embarking on as a collective and everyone here in this virtual space uh, is here to here because they're interested and they're committed and they're passionate about uh, the work that we're doing as it pertains to equity uh, and the three kind of legs that I will always stand on, especially as I like look at my screen and see the wide range of people that are here is that we show up to this this space and all work as it pertains to equity in a way that is intentional, non-transactional and sustainable. So this isn't just to check off a box for a grant or to uh, you know, apply for more money next year. Like if this work doesn't mean anything, if we aren't all in as, as a unit and understand the real ramifications and long-term impacts that our work have uh, within our community and how we use our respective platforms is speaks louder than, than words. So just wanted to provide that for you all. Um, thank you all for giving me the space and I'll turn it back over to Becky. Thanks, Sasha, um, and welcome everyone. Um, so this is a meeting on uh, making policy change, and we are um, we're blessed with having a couple experts on this field um, here to talk to us today. And uh, first is Andrea Freeman from the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, who's going to walk us through sort of policy 101 um, changes at the state level. Um, and then Liz Ogilvy, who many of you know from uh, many CHIP meetings, is going to um, give us a little history of, of the Healthy Incentives Program and uh, advocacy at, at various levels to, to build that program and make it a um, and the efforts to make it a permanent program. Um, so that I will turn it over to Andrea. And you can share your screen, Andrea. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Becky and Sasha. And uh, it's a privilege uh, to have time with you all. Thank you for inviting me um, to share this. I am, I'm the policy director with the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. I'm delighted to have a couple of my colleagues um, on here as well, as well as our kind of our board members, at least. Good to see you, Luz. And um, I can folks see my screen okay? Oops. Okay, I see a couple That's of names. Okay, great, thanks. So really quick, three learning objectives I'd like to, um, to, to touch on today. One, just so that you all um, understand the uh, basic structure and timeline of how the Massachusetts legislature works or doesn't work sometimes so well for us. And I'm just looking at some of some familiar faces on the screen here. I know that some of you, you might, you know, 
this is going to be some old hat for you, but maybe sometimes, you know, I always look at, uh, you know, sometimes presentations, there's always, maybe there's going to be a nugget of something helpful or to affirm. So I, I know some of you know that you're going to know this pretty well, but I hope it's helpful to you. So I want to understand the basic structure and timeline, want to make sure that folks know how to find out um, who their state representatives and senators are and how to contact them. And also to, um, we're going to walk through a process um, and to come up so that you'd be able to identify at least a couple um, strategic times of when to contact your state legislator in the future, um, you know, in order to affect policy change. And so with that, I will, um, you know, just going to pose this kind of rhetorical question of, you know, why should I contact why? my state legislators? And, um, you know, there's really, you know, one reason is for at the individual level um, and for constituent services for one on one. If you need help for some reason, uh, uh, that's always a reason to contact your legislator. But the reason I'm going to be talking about today is because, um, you know, there's something that you and your community, your neighborhood, your region, something that you need, something that you want and deserve. Um, and so that's what I'm going to focus on here today. Um, usually often when I start these kind of talks, these presentations, I, um, you know, I rattle off, you know, the fact that there's 160 state representatives, there's 40 senators, um, that they each earn, you know, something like 70 some thousand dollars a year. So it really is a full time job, you know, and that for, and not that most of them don't usually have challengers um, when they are up for election every two years. But today I'm going to start out with kind of a different, um, some, from a different approach. Um, I'm going to, um, you know, really focus more. I'm going to talk about one specific recent law that's been passed, a policy chain that was passed, um, thanks to the work of a lot of advocates. Um, it's something that I think folks can relate to. And then we're just going to work through that, you know, kind of that that process and identify those times um, for advocacy. Um, so basically what um, I'd like to, uh, you know, talk, start off talking today is about, um, uh, you know, is about uh, the fact that most, you know, most real world policy changes, they start with something that's very real that we, you can all, you know, any of us can relate to. Um, and then it gets kind of converted into like, policy wonk jargon and it gets messy and confusing and it's like it's all in a totally different language and a lot of the times it's really hard to understand and you need like I don't know someone who knows a special language or a lawyer to understand it and then before and then it gets kind of turned until it gets passed back in and turned back into legislation that hopefully or into law that really does affect people's lives um so it is it's kind of a messy process and um and it's a slow process as well um, you know, unless, of course, there's an emergency or unless there's a huge, a massive number of people of the public that, um, you know, weigh in on it, then things can happen pretty quickly. But the policy that I'm going to focus on today is one that, um, uh, you know, is one that, uh, um, that I think folks could relate to. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so the policy, it, it's going to be about, um, you know, a small but important tweak. This is a law that was passed this past fall. It's a small but important tweak to our social safety nets. And it's one that's designed to help get people, help ind individuals get out of poverty. Because um, as you know, most of our, our social safety nets um, in the throughout the country, they have some problems. Um, and and one of them, one of the problems is the fact that programs that operate, some of them operate on like an on and off switch. And that as soon as, as soon as someone earns a little bit more money or they, they get a raise or they get a new job, the, um, some of their, their benefits like for subsidized childcare for housing ends up being completely cut off. You know, first you have it, then you don't, you know, even though you're not earning enough money, um, to make up for that loss of benefit, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this term, you know, the, the cliff effect. Um, so the idea is that um, the, one of the solutions is that, you know, let's maybe we gradually turn, you know, um, reduce the benefits when a person gets a raise or, you know, their income goes up 
rather than doing it um, cold turkey. And so, so we're going to look at a legislative process to make um, to make this idea uh, to solve a problem into a law. And you know, granted, it's a law. Um, the, the law that got passed, it's just a pilot project. You know, it's a trial run for about 100 people over three years, but it's something. And so I just want, I want to point to it because it's something that's very real. It affects, going to affect specific people and hopefully lead to a bigger shift, you know, after this pilot project. So basically, and, um, you know, I want to point also that um, the idea from the solution came out of Western Mass, um, it came out of the um, Western Mass Economic Development Council. Um, and I want to make sure to say that, you know, there are many organizations and individuals that advocated for this policy change. Um, I can't name them all. I couldn't name them all if I, I tried. Um, but the key ones that are leading this coalition, the Economic Pathways um, uh, coalition are Springfield Works and the Food Bank of Western Mass because together they formed the Economic Pathways uh, Coalition. Um, and if you want to learn more information about that, um, economicpathwaysma.org. Okay, so we're going to jump into the process of getting a law passed. And I'm not a big football fan, I have to confess, um, but it does provide a little bit of a bit of a helpful um, analogy, um, if you're familiar with a sport at all, where the idea that what the team is blind, you know, you, the goal is to move the ball down the field um, bit by bit, sometimes by throwing, sometimes by pushing and shoving. Um, but even as you get to close to the goal line, where you're going to be able to score with a touchdown or a field goal, it's not always a guarantee that you're going to score. And sometimes if you don't score, you know, then you've got to wait until you get the ball again to start that drive all over again. Um, and so, but maybe you start that next drive um, closer to the end zone, um, or you maybe you start it further away, you know, depending on a variety of factors, some of which you don't have any control over. So the what I wanna talk about with regards to the, uh, the legislation for the Cliff Effect pilot program started in 2016. And again, the Western Mass Economic Development Council, you know, kind of had this idea um, for a pilot solution. And, um, you know, again, I don't, this is gonna be a simplified version and for folks who've been involved in it, um, you know, I may have some of the timelines slightly off or the details slightly off. So uh, bear with me here. Um, but so in 2016, the um, the council, you know, initiated this idea. So in January 2017, we've got, it's a start of a brand new legislative session um, when all the state senators and representatives are introducing or refiling bills and thousands of them get introduced in a very short period of time. And Representative Tassada and Senator Welch, um, who are no, currently no longer in office, they introduced the uh, Cliff Effect um, bills. They worked together and they put one in the Senate and one in the House. So they did that in January. And by February, they had four co-sponsors, like basically other people from Western Mass who agreed that that was a good idea, that that legislation is a good idea. Bill gets referred to the Joint Committee on Communities, Children, Families, and People with Disabilities. That's that little acronym. I just couldn't fit it in the square. So co-sponsors, gets a committee, gets a public hearing, and then the committee reports it out favorably to Ways and Means, which is huge. The fact that that happened so quickly was really progress. And I, I bet people really were feeling good about it, that it got that much motion right in the beginning. But then nothing happened. Um, and so you get into July, which is the kind of the end of the formal sessions for the legislature and nothing had happened. So it's basically dead. And then by the end of December, which of uh, the second after this two, second year session, it's really dead. So that was the one drive down the field. But let's, okay, so let's just go to the next legislative session here. So we get to 2019. Another odd year, starting odd numbered year, starting the two another two year legislative session, and Representative Vega um, and Senator Lesser this time they're the ones that they actually refiled the bill. And they probably revised it a little bit, but essentially um, it's the same legislation. And this time, um, this time they got twenty one co sponsors. So that's interesting. The comparison between four the first time around 
21 the next time. Again, it's referred to that same committee, children and families and people with disabilities. Again, it gets a hearing, although it's interesting that it's hearing is a little sooner in the year than it was the previous time. So that's kind of cool. But then there's no movement. <laughs> and then they get to uh, then they get to this point um, in mid-February where of the, the second year of the session where there's this looming internal deadline. Um, and it's a rule that both the House and the Senate have jointly agreed to, which says that if a bill hasn't been reported out of committee by this predetermined date in February of the second year, that that bill is either sent to study, which we know what that means. That means it's, you know, basically dead or the committee can vote to extend it. And so that they have more time to consider that bill. And keep in mind, this was right around this time. This was when, um, you know, the COVID lockdown was happening in case any but he forgot about that. Um, so anyways, the um, the committee agreed to extend it. They extended the life of this bill until May. They extended it until um, September. Um, and then interestingly enough, the formal sessions of the legislature, you know, ended at the end of June, but the committee still reported it out favorably. Really. So that was really, that was kind of a, a that was a pretty cool thing that they did because you want to have a good report, right? And any anything you're doing, you want to have a good report. You don't want to be forgotten. You don't want a bad report. You don't want to be ignored. Um, so that was a good move, but at the same, but the same time, it's still dead. So then we get to another year rolls around. Here come the new legislative session starting in tw January 21. Um, hopefully third time is a charm, right? Um, so this time, um, Representative Duffy, Representative Gonzalez, and Senator Lesser all, um, they introduced the bills. Basically, Reps Duffy and Gonzalez co-introduced a bill to the um, in the House and Senator Lesser into the Senate. They refiled the bill, tweaked a little bit. And this time, but even just seeing that there's Duffy and Gonzalez, oh, sorry, there's some spam calling in right now. Um, sorry about that. Um, but just to even see that there's more people, you know, who want to sponsor the legislation, there's a good sign. And then they got 39 co-sponsors compared to 21 the time before to four the time before. So that starts to tell you that it's getting a little more attention, a little more traction. And the interesting thing is that those 39 sponsors were from people all over the state, whereas previously it had pretty much mostly been just Western Mass folks. So again, starting to catch some, some momentum there, hopefully. Got the hearing, public hearing happened um, in September um, of that year. So we're still in good timing. And a um, couple months later in January, the bill was reported out favorably. But again, it sits, it sits. And you know, okay, are we gonna run into the same problem as last session? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, meanwhile, there's a different game going on on a different football field. And this is what this deal was had to do with the governor. Um, it was Governor Baker at the time. And most almost every second year of every legislative session, almost every time, um, there's an economic development bill, a big economic development bond bill um, that gets put forward. And in April, the governor put out this like three and a half billion dollar um, proposal for the bond bill. And um, everybody knows it's going to get attention. It's going to get taken up. It's like this big, it's this big bus that is going to make it through, you know, going to make it down the road, going to get to where it's going no matter what. So you know that that's an important piece of legislation. So um, the name of this, it, this bill, it was called something, it was like an act investing in the future opportunities of resiliency workforce and revitalized downtowns. But everybody called it the Economic Development Bond Bill or simply the Ec Dev Bill. Um, you know, when bills get nicknames, you know, they're big deals. Um, so May and June, this the Ec Dev Bill goes to another, it goes to committee, there it goes to a second committee, they get hearings in both places. Um, you know, it's it's chugging through. And then in July, um, you know, the committee gives it a favorable report out. And a mere a couple weeks later, the full house took it up for to debate for debate. This means they're really taking it seriously. They're all there's hundreds of amendments get proposed. They pass oh. a couple of them, and the house ultimately passes um, its version of the economic development bill. 
And then like the following week, the Senate does the same thing, um, considering a bunch of amendments again. I mean, like hundreds of them, because every senator will submit a couple, at least some of them will put in a ton. So in this huge pile of amendments that come through for this, you know, almost $4 billion bill, were a few, um, what, there was an amendment from Senator Lesser um, and it included one that had the very same language that was in the Cliff Effect bill. So we've got, it's a separate bill, but you can kind of hitch a ride on a different, bigger bill that is moving. And so that 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 technique gets used every now and then. And it, in this uh, case, we had some good news with it because um, otherwise the bill had just been hanging out in ways and means, you know, going nowhere. Um, so, so Senator Lesser put forth an amendment, um, and, but again, so did the other 39 senators, they were all putting forth amendments. So there's a lot of competition still going on of who gets what in the bill. So again, not many amendment, amendments were adopted, but, you know, spoiler alert, Senator Lesser's cliff effect amendment did get adopted and it got ultimately included in the Senate's version of the bill. But remember, it's not yet in the House version. So the two versions have to get mashed up. They have to get molded together into one bill before it can anything can go to the governor. And so to do this kind of mashup of the two, um, the House bill and the Senate bill, um, the House chooses three of its people, and the Senate chooses three of its people. And I swear to God, I think they go into like a cage fight or something um, because it's this big mystery. Nobody knows um, what actually happens when these the three and the three people get together because it's not public. It's totally behind closed doors. There's no media in it. Um, it's just kind of a lockbox in there. Um, but fortunately, Senator Lesser was selected to be um, part of the Senate's three person team, um, which was which is called a, a conference committee. And so that was back in July, right? Everybody goes away for August, September. We don't hear anything about the act of bill or the conference committee. And we're all crossing our fingers. We hear nothing about this act of bill until November 2nd, when it emerges from the mysterious conference committee and it's all molded together into one bill and it has the cliff effect language in it. So there's really one more hurdle to go, right? Um, and so the very following day, um, it's uh, the bill was the language they call it. It was laid before the governor. Um, and at this point, it's like, you know, a three point seven, three point eight billion dollar bill. And the governor, you know, he has kind of he has a line item veto, so he could still scratch it out if he wanted to. So they were still worried that oh, we made it this far. We made it this far. But he crosses out a few things, but not the cliff effect language. And it was got signed into law on November 10th, 2022. OK. So where were the key points um, to contact uh, reps and senators? This is a question I'm gonna posing to you all. Where are the key times? Is there something in the chat here? Yes. And if I can't see hand, if hands are raised or anything, um, but if you want, if anybody wants to come off chat, folks know when there are key times to speak up during any, any one of these processes. Okay. I can take a guess, Andrea. <laughs> oh, you know, Luz, good to see you. Hi. When? Want me to take a guess? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, during the public hearing or before, after, during public hearing, and then again, um, when the debate and the uh, is going on between senators and and representatives. Absolutely. So in these public hearings, and then um, actually, if we you oh, spoiler, um, and then when it's taken up in the debate. Yep. Any other times? A plus. Anybody else? Any other times that are key advocacy times? Um, this is Alan just coming off mute. Um, hey, Alan. Hey, good to see you. Um, if you it depends. 
sometimes it depends if you know somebody on the committee or if one of your legislators on the committee, that's a good time to say, hey, I see you're on the committee for such and such. So I'm looking at those joint committee meetings. So if you know when those are just before then is a good time. Absolutely. Especially if there's no movement, um, like if the uh, Committee on uh, Children, Families and People with Disabilities, they reported out to Ways and Means, but then nothing is happening. You know, do you, who's on Ways and Means? Is there anybody you know, or is you constituent of someone who's on Ways and Means? Yep, absolutely. Andrea, this is Liz, you can't see hands, I know. So um, Zeta put in every step of the way and I'm with Zeta. Right. I every single opportunity. You're at, you're getting a grant from someone and your legislator, legislator comes to that check signing and there are residents there. I'm gonna talk about HIP a little bit, but I'll talk about uh, universal school meals. Um, so- Why don't, I was just gonna finish up. Do you wanna make a, a, a point here I'm and save it for your No, I'm gonna make a point about every step of the way. These awesome. are, that Andrea list are really critical, but those moments become a reminder when every single time you see, touch, call, email a legislator, you say, don't forget about free meals. We all, many of us work with residents. And so if um, Senator Gomez is somewhere and you're talking to him and there's a resident that you know can do this, have her come up and have her say, you know, I'm so grateful for universal school meals till the end of the year. And we're really hoping it becomes permanent. Those moments with our engaged legislators merit so much more than the reminder calls that we will make. All those reminder calls that we will make during the time period that Andrea highlights, it's just to say, do you remember meeting so-and-so when you were out visiting us, you know, I've been calling you about this all the time and talking to you about it for the last year, but it's because I know it's as important to you as it is to me. These legislators are our friends and neighbors. So it's important to understand the calendar, but it's more important to understand that advocacy happens every single day. Exactly what she said. And knowing that there, you know, Everybody's got limited time and limited resources and energy, and that sometimes you've got multiple different issues that you're juggling. Um, you know, sometimes you do have to pick and choose. And so I've got a couple like these yellow, um, I thought they were going to look like stars, but they kind of look like something out of Shazam um, from my youth. Um, but to identify that in the beginning, like even to get that bill introduced, like it probably wasn't the representative or the senator's idea to, they didn't, you know, they probably didn't even know about the cliff effect, much less a possible solution. You know, it was the Western Mass Economic Development Council um, that probably brought forth the idea and then and got it going. So even just getting legislation introduced the first time, also getting it refiled. If it doesn't make it the first session, getting it refiled. Sometimes the, the representative isn't in office the next time, or maybe their interests have changed and stuff. So you might have to find somebody else to do it. Building co-sponsors is a key time. Public hearings, just like Lou said, key time. Um, and then always, you know, always during, you know, in in the debate when there are amendments, because a lot of things happen really quickly then. And the also, and just like Liz was saying, um, these little pink hearts here are also key times. Thank yous are essential. Um, you know, when somebody co-sponsors a bill, when somebody, you know, when it gets pushed out of, you know, it gets moved out of committee. Thank you. It's just contacting people, contacting legislators, or, you know, when you see them in the community, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's key to thank them, to contact them when you don't have an ask of them. Um, so th that's, a, you know, and I also just want to mention that, um, you know, it, you don't need hundreds of people contacting a legislator or even dozens um, you don't need a hundred, you know, you don't need massive amounts of people to make a, um, to make a difference. Um, Cause I've talked to legislators and staffers and they've told me that you can get five or six calls or emails on the same bill around the same time on the same issue that makes them listen up. They really listen up at that point. Um, the key on our end is to be organized enough to get a handful, you know, to get just handfuls of constituents to do that outreach 
with the same request at about the same time. And yeah, it, it, it's hard work, but that's what being organized, you know, is, is about, and it is doable and it does make a difference. Um, so I'm just going to move on real quickly here because one other key thing is to make sure um, if you're not sure who your state representative or your state senator is, you, honestly, you can Google who, you know, who is, where do I vote? Um, who is my state representative? You can Google that and these websites will pop up. Um, and you can, um, you know, if you go to the malegislature.gov, that'll get you their contact, contact information um, as well. Um, and the, yeah, and then there's just lots of other ways about the strategies of, you know, when and why and how to meet with them. But just, you know, like Liz was saying, the key thing is to just start building that relationship with your elected officials because you've got information that is valuable to them. You know, they don't know everything that's going on in the community. They need they need to hear from us. Um, and uh, yeah, so not rocket science here, but just wanted to share with you um, a little bit about the process. So with that, I guess I'm turning it over to um, Malika or Becky. Um, yeah. I'll Take it. And then, um, yeah, so thanks, Andrea. Um, Mix, we're going to, um, Liz is going to give us a little overview of um, our history of the story about HIP um, and sort of where it started and, and how it grew over time. You ready, Liz? I am. I'm going to ask people, if they can, to please turn their screens on. Y'all, it's just hard to talk to the little black boxes. I'm on Zooms all day long, just like you all are. Mine started today at 7.30, and I need to see your lovely faces to keep myself uh, highly engaged. And so Andrea gave us this, and I am a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. I spent half my life growing up in Texas, but I won't use football because... I always had a bad week, but sadly, friends, the Patriots, not that I really care, but my husband does, are not having a good year this year. That's not going to happen to any of our bills, but it is a good analogy in that advocacy can take a really long time. And just like if you follow the Patriots, they're kind of in this rebuilding season. Some of what Andrea, you're going to be sorry you used football, was describing is that we have seasons that are killer seasons where we have a quarterback who throws a long field pass and we we are able to run the ball. And then we have seasons like y'all are having now with lots of fits and starts. The most important thing is to keep your eye. It's a long game. Advocacy is a really long game. And so those ebbs and flows of going into committee, coming out of committee, getting amendments, they're always going to be there. They get easier when we do this day-to-day, -day, ongoing, constant advocacy. The cliff effect is something we really should all care about because we may have personally experienced it in our families or we know residents. I've had residents say, I got a 25 cents raise at work and then I lost my child care voucher. That's the cliff effect. I've had people tell me who worked for GTC, I don't want that promotion because all my food stamps will go away. And the money that's gonna be in the promotion isn't enough to close the gap on the food stamps and my HIP benefit. That's my segue. So HIP started out as an idea at the Springfield Food Policy Council table. And that's generally how most things get to a legislator. It's usually those of us who work with residents who are hearing things, or those of us who are working in spaces and hearing things. And we say, gosh, you know, we just go through this every year or I hear this every day, what can we do? When I worked on school food, I was hearing all the time two things, how bad the food was and how much of a burden the application was for families. Many applications are not in dual languages. 
And so applying for anything is really hard. So when we have an opportunity to make something a policy that families don't have to apply for, we make everything easier for them. Being poor means you work harder at everything. What money does is it allows you to buy your way out of the chaos that is our lives. And depending upon how much money you have, you can do more of that. Many of us were able to order groceries during the pandemic. And those of us who weren't dependent upon public benefits, that was even easier. For families who were dependent upon them, you couldn't call up Stop and Shop um, and have your food delivered initially. And then Stop and Shop and Big Y got really smart and recognized they were losing a lot of their SNAP customers. And they had lobbyists, not regular advocates like us, who got on it and got the government to approve them as online SNAP providers, even though farmers markets couldn't do transactions online. GTC's farm store couldn't do transactions online for people with public benefits. That's just a more recent illumination because you can all think about people who you served who didn't have access during those periods. So when we're doing advocacy, it's usually to help people have more access. Pre-HIP, the way that people were able to stretch their dollars and afford farmers markets is because farmers markets or farm stands or a place like GTC um, would apply for double up bucks coupons. And the food bank often sponsored those programs. So maybe some of the folks you serve would have these coupons and they could go to the farmer's market and transact them and get twice as much money for their coupon. That was what was happening at GTC. But we were constantly seeing people lose their coupons or not have enough coupons. It was an administrative huge burden for GTC to have to try and navigate that. So GTC was a member of the Food Policy Council. And at that policy council table, we were talking about everything that was a barrier for people to access food. There was an amazing person who some will remember, his name was Frank Martinez Nochito, his name is still that, he's just living in Maine now. But he was working at DTA, the Department of Transitional Assistance at the time. Frank uh, had a background in nutrition, he went to Tufts, he just understood advocacy and he said, I have an idea, what if the coupons don't exist. What if we can get money and get DTA to attach it to the EBT card and all people have to do is come and swipe their card? And we were like, glory, hallelujah. And so Frank took the lead and Ann Richmond from Guarding the Community and I and a few other people worked on a grant to the USDA. And we funded HIP for the first time in 2011. This is the reason I'm telling you this is a long game. And the first couple of years, that's how HIP was funded. And it had a very small amount of money. And it was only available to pilot organizations in Springfield and Holyoke. And I've known some of you since before 2011. So you know how long we've been at this. DTA was resistant. They didn't want one more thing to have to administer. And we lived through two commissioners of that agency that would not support HIP. But along the way, GTC did things like invite our legislators to come to food demonstrations on our um, sale days long before we had our farm store. And they would see people who were in the pilot using their benefit be so excited. You see a little kid jumping up and down because he's going to get peaches this week and he had them for the first time last week. You don't forget that. That's better than any email reminder, any compelling talk Liz can give, any phone call, anything that we can do. So we began to build in Western Mass this consensus of legislators who said, well, we should fund this. And so they then went back and talked to other legislators. I, in the meantime, had been talking to people all over the state about school food. So I started talking to those people about HIP 
and they got their legislators engaged. And then the legislator legislature started funding HIP as an earmark. So some of you probably get earmarks in your organizations. It was just a budget line. And every year we would run out of money. So some of you might remember that HIP would just stop because, and then we'd go back to those legislators and they would go into special session where they do um, the budget amendments and there would be a special budget and we'd get a little more money. Along the way, we were quietly talking to legislators about this needs to be permanent. I'm also, I'm smart, but I'm also kind of crafty and strategic. And we started featuring farms and farmers that were making money because initially nobody wanted it. Farmers didn't want it to be permanent because they didn't want long lines. And I'm going to be really transparent. White farmers didn't want long lines of black and brown people at their farms. And that's who they perceived were going to use HIP. Till they heard that a nonprofit in Lowell made $500,000 one year, one season, saved their family farm, and everybody wanted HIP. One white farmer got engaged. I'm sorry, I mixed up the stories, but the nonprofit made $50,000. It has a mobile market in Lowell, and they made $50,000 the first year that they used HIP. The next year, a white farmer came home. He was a teacher, came home to help his father close the farm. They accepted HIP because he wanted every penny he could get to try to get his parents out of debt. And DTA sent out a flyer saying, here's where you can use your HIP benefit. He's in the eastern part of the state. Every poor white person drove to that farm. He's the one who made a half million dollars in one year. And then every white farmer signed up. When all the white farmers signed up, they started calling their legislators. We were calling for different reasons. They were calling because they knew it was gonna enable them to make money at home and they were gonna save on fuel costs. They weren't gonna to have to sell their food in Connecticut or Rhode Island or Vermont or New Hampshire. They could sell it locally. They knew they were gonna be selling to people who looked like them because when folks drove by the farm that made $500,000, they didn't see a bunch of poor white people. They saw a bunch of people at the farm and he got regular customers too. They said, oh, his tomatoes must be really good. And farmers were figuring that out. So suddenly we had an advocacy audience that expanded exponentially. So very conservative legislators in other parts of the state were hearing calls around, we really need this. At the same time, that advocates from Springfield and Holyoke and Lawrence and Chelsea were calling and saying, we need this for our families. It's the only way they can eat healthy food. And we were getting smarter at it as we went along. I was not a policy person, but I was beginning to understand as a black person living in Mason Square that I wasn't predestined to become diabetic or have a heart disease or hypertension just because I was black as a lot of people of color think, it's because I have 10 McDonald's within a mile and three quarters of my house and no good grocery store or consistent farmer's market. So we had residents who were able to talk about the first time their kids had berries because they were able to buy them at the farm store and the farm stand. Here we are 12 years later and HIP is in play for permanent legislation. Everything doesn't take 12 years, but what's really important to use Andrea's analogy is a quarterback who stays focused on the goal, who has running backs, who he can throw the ball to and they can carry it down the field if you understand football. I, it's kind of like a hip quarterback. I wasn't a very good quarterback, but I was not letting the ball go. I got sacked time and time again, but the ball was still underneath me when I stood up. And then I had a couple of folks, I don't know Patriots well enough to call their people, but Emmett Smith, best running back Cowboys have ever had. 
I had a couple of Emmets who were always ready for me to throw the ball whatever distance I could, and they would help carry that ball down the line. Those running backs were my legislators and your legislators. They were in the House, um, Aaron Vega. So even though I wasn't in Holyoke, I knew he understood this. He knew me. He knew people in Holyoke who, when I said, this is why we really need it, residents would raise their hands and say, yes, and here's my family story. And he ran that ball every chance he could. Carlos Gonzalez was one of those running backs. Uh, Jose Tassado, who will remember was a city councilor and had been hearing us talk about food insecurity. And, and I mentioned that because we all need to engage our city councilors more in this advocacy conversation. Becky, cut me off when it's time because I'm not tracking myself because they need to be able to call legislators. Our worst advocates at the state legislator, legislature are our city councilors, and I own that. I need to do a better job of making sure that the things we care about get on their screen in small, understandable bites, and that they know what it means for their constituents. So those folks who are working on the cliff effect right now, we need those residents who are holding on to the traction that they've made, who are in that pilot to be telling those stories. And it's really hard because we basically ask them to do what we do and that's put on a dog and pony show. And I hate doing that to residents, but residents are boats. And so when our state legislators and our city councilors understand that, they listen, they listen to us as well, but they hear from us all the time. So I'm learning how to make sure that our residents are positioned and that they're compensated. Don't ask people to go have these hard conversations and do it for free. People who do this for a living make really good money. I don't, I'm making better money, but that's my choice because I choose to share our budget with residents. So I encourage you, whatever you're thinking about, if you have an idea, you can call me up and I'll coach you through how to have a conversation with your legislature. We have really good legislators now who have really good aides who say to me, what are you thinking about? What's your dream? Tell me, can we work on it? Senator Adam Gomez, I think is a treasure who is becoming more and more of a treasure every single day. I have to explain so little, but it's because he listened when he was on the city council and he has worked really hard to educate himself. Um, Rep Gonzalez is the same way. I think they're all available to us. And I think we have to be better at making sure they understand the conditions of the lives of our communities and the differences that these things we advocate for, how they'll make it better. And then use the food bank, use Alan and Laura Sylvester at the food bank taught me more than I can hold in my head about the cliff effect. So if I'm talking to a legislator, I'm always talking about HIP. I'm always talking about universal school meals and I know how they vote. You can see the way they vote and the Food Policy Council just hired several staff people. So we're gonna be sending you out emails to say this vote is happening next week. Can you call these key people? Or this bill is advancing. We need co-sponsors. Here's the language you use. Can you cut and paste and put it in an email and ask them because if we're really going to move policy, we have to be able to call each other in in those spaces. We also need to hear from you. Maybe you have some food access idea. And you're like, well, I'm thinking about this, but I don't know. I am telling you, I don't know if there's anybody. Well, Andrea taught me a lot. She's probably the person who's known me the longest in this policy, policy space. This was not my space. I wouldn't have ever thought that I would stand before the Speaker of the House, who is very key, because even when you, you could have 20 legislators 
who really support a bill in, in the House. Um, this is the House of Representatives for the state. You could have 20 folks who support it, but if the speaker's not on board, the speaker never calls for a vote. So it's really important. I'm learning how to work with their aides to make sure that they're constantly understanding who the key, whether it's in the Senate or whether it's in the House, who are the key people they need to hear from. The easier we can make our legislators jobs, the more we get. I hope I didn't lull you into relaxation, or if I did, I hope you really needed that moment of relaxation. Thanks, Liz. That was perfect timing. <laughs> Never happens. That's great. Um, so I think we could, um, Andrea's going to tell us about some bills to watch, but I just want to pause here and see if there's any questions or comments that anyone has um, before we switch back over to Andrea. And feel free to unmute. Okay, I don't see any right now. So um, Andrea, we wanna go ahead and talk about some things to watch. Somebody has a question. Benjamin, <laughs> ask a question that you already know the answer to. Just to, I have, no, we are oh, friends. I know okay. most of you. Alan has a question. <laughs> I have a comment. Or um, It's also important to, like, if you come in the middle of something, like I did, I think it was um, breakfast after the bell, you might just take the assumption that this is something that your organization has done. or um, And so, Liz, in terms of teaching people things, sometimes you just need to listen and go back and say, how did something start? And um, so not just thank your legislators, but then thank the people that actually started it. It's really easy to... Um, if a medium size or larger organization starts to run with something, it's um, one can easily be guilty of not paying proper um, honor to the, the ideas and where they came from. So it's important to look both directions, look forward, but don't forget to look back and the history. And I'm glad that Liz, I'm glad yours was a history of something because that just shows um, the importance of that. So I just wanted to share that comment. And I really appreciate that gift, Ellen. Um, Project Bread has been doing lots of, look at what we did in three years around school food. But the Food Bank of Western Mass was supporting my work around school food. My son was not much bigger than Sasha's baby when I started it, and he's now 14. And it wasn't because I knew so much about school food, I knew nothing. My husband was an administrator at Commerce, and he would come home from school hungry every day, even though I made him a breakfast sandwich and I made him a really good lunch. And our son was a baby. And I'm like, what is up? He would come in the house just starving. And he finally admitted, well, I don't eat my breakfast or lunch. I give it to my kids because they come to my office when they're getting suspended and say, Mr. Ogilvy, I yelled at my teacher. I got in a fight because... I haven't had anything to eat for two days. And it broke me wide open. Broke me wide open. And I started asking a lot of questions. I was not highly engaged in GTC. I had worked at affordable housing in other cities. I knew nothing about food. So I say that to say, you may think you're not an advocate. You don't know. And paying honor to that is important because People don't remember that for nine years, I drove all around the state trying to get poor white women to understand that they didn't need to be ashamed because they were sending their kids hungry in the same way that I was talking to poor black and brown women here and poor white women here, that we shouldn't be ashamed. The shame is not on residents. The shame is on our government. Thank you. Um, okay, any other questions? And we can also um, have more after Andrea's next thing. <clears throat> uh, Brother Al here, how you doing? Bro Brother Al oh, from the hey, Men of Brother. Color Health Awareness. How you doing, man? Brother Al from the Men of Color Health Awareness, uh, Mocha. Um, I, Liz, I, 
I, I want to ask permission to use your quarterback analogy because that was right on point uh, about um, team leadership and how do we direct uh, our men to bring in a positive return. Uh, and I, I really like the way you explain that you being a quarterback in this uh, opportunity to have this conversation now today and where it started from. So thank you for all the hard work you do. And uh, if you got any more of them collard greens over there, I truly appreciate some out of your garden. That was really smooth, Brother Al. I'll make a deal. There's a grant I want to talk to you about. So if you come over and talk to me about it, I'll give you some collard greens. Just if I'm coming over, to, you might as well cook them. Now, listen, hold up. You got to cook them okay, then if you want agree. me to come over. Okay, take it back, Becky, because see how it goes awry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm all, I'm, we'll talk, Liz. Thank you. That's the conversation we have senators make and registrations. You know, I want such and such. Well, okay, you do such and such, and I'll do such and such. That's just how it works. You're right, Charlie. Thank you. And I I wanted to chime in, too. This is Zeta Govan. I'm a city councilor now. But I think in 2009, when this work started in Mason Square, um, I remember Liz, you know, I think GTC was just starting. We were actually in the fight to bring a, a full line grocery store to the city to grow community gardens. Um, and the Springfield Food Policy Council came about, you know, so um, it is a long game. And sometimes we lose some of our patience, but um, staying in the game, I think is what's key. And I'm just really excited that the the cliff effect bill is going to come through. I know it's not called that now, but that's what um, we need. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thanks for, for being here, Zeta. It's, uh, it's great to see a, a local policy person too. Um, Okay, any other questions or comments right now? I have a question that yes. maybe the cliff effect bill will take is taken care of. I don't know. And that is so often we we have regulations for the Earth Department, all sorts of places. And one requirement cuts you out of something else. Um if you want to buy a home at a at the tax auctions with the city, you have to post $5,000, which means immediately you're no longer eligible for your subsidized housing because you got over $2,500. And nobody thinks of that. I mean, I'm just saying so many times I'm in meetings and somebody says, well, they can't do that because if they do that, then they're no longer eligible for the housing. Welfare gives the check in two parts. They tell me if they get it in one part, they wouldn't be eligible next month. So it, it's this is a start, but I would like to see all sorts of regulations everywhere just sort of understand something that sounds good to you right now might actually mean that people can't be part of your program because it endangers other things. It's, I think this is a start, but it's, we've got to look more than just a couple places. I don't know, I don't know if I'm saying this right or not, but I'm, I just, this way it is. I, 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 I was surprised and shocked the other day when I, somebody told me about a house auction and I took a look at the rules and sure enough, they got the rule back in there that you have to be ineligible for your housing if you want to take a tax structure. Up, up, and, and you might not even pay 5000 You might pay 2000 for the dumb house. Well, now you're going to pay you 5000 Charlie. But Charlie's make, the point Charlie's making is that, you know, we're all focused on the goal. Catherine Rattay talks so beautifully about this. I said to her once, I'm sick of people talking about food pantries and food banks as emergency food. People rely on them regularly. It's not an emergency. Every person I know, it's built in, even with HIP. 
And Catherine said, it's because we're not talking about the real emergency. And that is the ongoing, unrelenting emergency of poverty and how our systems are constructed to keep people in poverty. Because what you're speaking to, Charlie, is you can't accumulate any assets when you live in public housing, when you're dependent upon um, the um, temporary assistance to needy families, TANF, um, old bad language welfare. There's more corporate welfare than there is any other kind of welfare, right? But these are policy, potential policies. So if that's something that you care about, like the asset piece, why can't poor people save? Then you got to find others who care about that same thing and a legislator or two who also cares about that. And I know all of ours in Western, at least all of the ones in Springfield and Holyoke do. And brainstorm an idea on a bill. And sometimes what you first put forth isn't what you end up with, but it's recognizing that every single person has an idea about something and then seeing how many people are impacted by that same thing. Because what Charlie raises, I bet almost everybody here, Nairobi has probably had to turn people away um, from programs because they had a little too much money. And the little too much isn't enough to move them out of poverty. So if we really want to eradicate poverty, that's where policy is really important. To me, as a Black person, policy doesn't guarantee that it's going to work out. But without it, without either presidential acts or legislative acts, I might not be sitting here talking to you. Slavery was law. And it was in the state of Massachusetts, lawmakers who stopped slavery before the Emancipation Proclamation. That's a really big one and hard for you to get your head around. And has it made everything okay? Absolutely not. But we have the policies to attach to. Now that we have, when we have a policy around HIP, the legislature will have to fund it before it was up to them. So that's why this matters in ways that may feel like, oh, Liz, we are just trying to do the work. We have too much to do. I live in that same space with y'all, but we gotta have policies because I'm not young anymore. I was youngish when I started this. So if we weren't working on policy, then everybody is starting everything over every single time. At least now we're working to upgrade the policies that we have. Sorry, Becky. No, that's a that's a great um, point, Liz. And I think part of the reason we we wanted to have this meeting and training is um, as we work on strategies for the chip. You know, a lot of the strategies we work on are sort of programs and. Um, you know, funding outreach and things like that. But as we do these this work, we see where there are barriers and issues with different programs that, you know, as we as we gain that understanding through the work on the ground or most of you through the work on the ground, that's when we can start thinking about, you know, bringing in legislators and saying, you know, hey, we're, we're seeing these barriers like like with HIP, you know, the people in lines and having to run the card a million times, you know, that's that could be a change either at the policy level or at a systems level, you know. So um, I guess I encourage us all as we're meeting in community teams to think about what are some potential policy changes um, that we can bring to our legislators um, and also look at, at bills that are being proposed and, you know, do they all, do they cover some things we've already been talking about. Um, and so maybe, maybe Andrea, that's a good segue if you have any that you want to just highlight uh, based on some of the CHIP priorities. Sure, thank you. Yeah, the um, 
there are, you know, a lot of different, you know, coalitions and organizations identify, you know, some state level policies that they want to focus on. And, you know, th there's a whole priority setting process you can do, or, you know, there's, you know, there's so many options out there, but I'm just going to share with you a few, because sometimes even if an organization picks their priority, it might not get any, you know, unless sometimes the legislature chooses or the governor chooses what's going to kind of take all the oxygen um, in the room. And sometimes it's really important. In fact, right now, one of the big the big new legislation that the governor introduced a couple of weeks ago is um, is a housing bond bill, which usually comes about um, every five years. And it's it's a it's it's significant amount of money. And there's a bunch of policies in it that would um, uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat here. Um, for folks to see, get to, there's a kind of a summary, um, a couple summary um, fact sheets about it from the governor's office. Um, but the advocates so far are really um, very encouraged by this and very supportive of it in terms of the amount of money to help improve public um, public housing um, facilities across the state about um, uh, is, uh, providing more funding for um, to build affordable housing, um, as well as policy changes like allowing for um, in-law apartments to be built, um, you know, by by right. Um, they in the in the language there they call them accessory dwelling units or ADUs, but. I think, you know, we know what you mean. If you can, you know, if you, if somebody's got space to, um, if you can convert a garage into, you know, a one bedroom apartment or a studio for, so that you can rent it out or a friend can live there or something like that. Um, because we have, we're 200,000 units short of housing in Massachusetts. Um, it's just a huge game of musical chairs where there's just not enough chairs anywhere close. And so, of course, that drives up the pricing. So the housing bond bill is one that um, is going to need some advocacy because while the governor's version that she puts in, it's it's really good if we could get it passed, you know, as is. That would be pretty darn good. But there's going to be people fighting against some of these things. Um, so we're, you know, when the House takes it up and the Senate takes it up, um, we're going to need to defend some of the good stuff um, that's in there and, you know, and tweak some of it um, as well. Um, the another th um, thing, and I, I, I know the the health equity category of the chip, another bill I wanted, a specific bill I wanted to mention, um, uh, it's um, an act to advance um, health equity that was um, introduced by um, uh, Representative Will Bud Williams um, and um, had a hearing a month or so ago, I think we testified at. So this, the an advance, uh, act to advance health equity, um, and this is a link to the fact sheet, not the actual um, bill language, um, but it, it's really, it's a big multifaceted omnibus um, bill. And one of the main things that it would do is establish um, a an office secretariat that reports to the governor, an office of equity um, that would be direct report to the governor that would always be, um, you know, always be thinking about, you know, um, you know, who's missing out, who, who who's not benefiting from things and how can we fix that? So that's one of the key things. Um, Another one, uh, another bill um, that actually just, let's see, I think it just got reported out. Um, so it kind of moved down the field, you know, the chains got moved down the field a little bit more. And yes, Liz, I do know what the chains are for in football. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, this is an um, act to ensure equitable health coverage for children. Um, which is basically regardless, um, it's a bill to make sure ki kids, regardless of immigration status, um, that they're able to get um, more complete health care um, through Mass Health. Right now, it's a total patchwork of what they're able to get and not, and it's just really, it's really missing out. Um, um, and then I know um, mental health and harm reduction. Uh, there's a bill, there's actually a real growing movement for um, uh, for harm reduction for um, overdose prevention sites. Um, and so here's a link to the coalition um, that's leading a campaign for legislation 
that would make overdose prevention sites um, legal um, in Massachusetts. I know Somerville and Worcester are really thinking about moving ahead with them, whether they're state, they're legal in the state or not. Um, and then I know youth, uh, in terms of youth mental health, um, we uh, we recently released a, um, a, a report about uh, the roadmap for youth mental health in Western Mass and the legislation that we our support you're recommending as a result of that is all linked. It's it's linked to the um, children's mental health campaign, um, and it mo the most of it has to do with school based uh, supports for um, uh, to be have comprehensive behavioral health programs within schools. So, you know, there's lots more things that I could go on about. I know um, gun violence and domestic. Um, uh, interpersonal violence, um, interpartner violence. Um, I can tell you there is, the House has passed a law, um, a new law. It's different than the ones that you see signs for all over. I think it, you know, it says there's a bunch of people who are fighting um, any further um, uh, firearms uh, restrictions. And it, I think it says like, stop H4420, um, that's already been tossed, that's already done, that's passe, that's been done, it's been totally redone. And so um, this is the bill that um, the House recently passed, but the um, the Senate hasn't taken it up yet. But I, I'm not I'm not closely involved in that yet, so I apologize, I don't have a, a link I can uh, share to that, that with you right now, but I, I will when I, I give Becky um, the, you know, this, this full sheet, but so those are just a few that I wanted to toss out there, but I'm sure others have, um, recommend thoughts and thoughts that they'd like to toss into the mix as well. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. Is there anyone, um, looking at specific legislation, either through your organization or your community, um, feel free to toss it out and, We'll send, um, after the meeting, we'll send the list of, of bills that Andrea referred to. And, you know, I feel very confident about HIP, but I still really want y'all to call. I know there are probably people who have no idea what I'm talking about HIP. The Healthy Incentives Program gives every single person who receives SNAP an extra produce benefit. That benefit has to be used at HIP authorized providers. In Springfield, that is farmers markets, there are generally HIP providers at every market. The Go Fresh mobile market, which goes to very specific locations, but anybody can shop at the market when they're parked at those locations. And GTC, and GTC is the only year round fixed location. We have almost 21,000 families on HIP who are, I'm sorry, on SNAP who are HIP eligible. Folks get between 40, 60, or $80 a month. Every single one of us knows somebody who's never used their HIP benefit in the seven years that it's been regularly available. You add up $40 a month times seven years. But just imagine 10%, we use less than the, the SNAP recipients, less than 1% of them are using this benefit. If 2000 people start using it at $40 a month and they shop at Go Fresh and GTC, it changes the financial trajectory of those organizations. I want you to imagine 80,000 extra dollars moving through our neighborhoods. That's just if we get 10% of the people activated. And everybody here is working with poor people. They need to know about this. And that bill- That's a loss of almost a half a thousand dollars a year. So we'll make sure that bill is on Becky's list. And please y'all, I'm half dead. If you go chronologically, I'm more than half dead. I'm in the third quarter of the game. 
We're a little bit up, but like the Cowboys, I can get confused and lose ground and lose the game like we did last week. Help me stay focused on the end goal and not only get hit, but the extra point. And I will cook collard greens for everybody. And Luz will make rice and beans to go with them. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Thank you. And I also just um, put in the chat here, in case folks are curious, you know, very different part of the region, but um, Franklin County, um, their chip, um, I just put a link to their legislative priorities. You know, some, chip, some chips have them, some chips don't. Um, but in case you're curious to see what a, a rural part of the region um, is prioritized. Andrea, I'm not sure if it's my computer, but when I click on your first bill, um, it doesn't open up to the housing bond bill. Oh, really? It's yeah, I put a different. Yeah. I put a different link in there, but I wasn't sure if that was the page you were <laughs> trying to get to. But yeah. That oh, interesting. Oh, huh, I'm sorry. Did you find it? Because I just clicked on it now, and it worked. It worked for me. But let me. Uh, I'll be. I'll with a handout that I'll get to Becky. I'll have better. Links. Yeah. Did you did you get like a four oh four lose or was it something else? It was a weird page. I got I got it too. <laughs> yeah, it was oh, like yeah. a proof proof point security something or other. So you might just have access because you're logged into something on you know, I don't know. But Oh, you know what? Oh, I think you're right. I think it was like, yeah, I think our security, our firewalls did something weird to it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted Sometimes to say Sometimes if a link doesn't work, start taking off from the right to the left in sections, especially if it's dash something, dash something. And when you do that, you get back often to the page where it relates to where you want to because the last little bit might have gotten changed. And sometimes it's something that's added because of a security within an organization. And if you can get past that, you can get to the link. Thanks, Charlie. Luz, did you have something else you wanted? Yeah, I was just going to say this has been great. Um, but then also, I think it's helpful if at some point there's some talk about local policy too, as um, local policy, and then also about implementation, because a lot of these things become law and then they just sit there mm -hmm. forever. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Thank you for saying that, Liz. We talked about housing. And Massachusetts accepted, um, I think it's Article Q of the International Residential Code, which get, allow us for smaller houses um, and, and accessory buildings. However, every single city and town has to adopt it. It's local adoption. So sometimes something gets passed at the state level. But unless we advocate, our local city or town doesn't do it because they have to adopt it. They have to accept it. Right, mm -hmm. housing. Yeah, a lot of housing is local. Um, yeah. That's. I believe what the what's in the the governor put in the bond bill would make it so that it would apply by right. Um, that it wouldn't you wouldn't need the local approval. But of course, that's just the first draft, right? That's just her draft for now. That's <laughs> right. It could take a while. Um, I did create a short survey um, just to see. Um, if you all have other things that you want to um, learn from the chip and um, see how your learning was today. Um, so fill that out when you get a chance. Um, any other comments, questions before we close out today? I don't see any. Okay. Well, um, if none, I appreciate you all for coming and we will um, send out more information after the meeting and um, think about trainings, you know, other trainings too. Um, the local policy change one is a great um, suggestion. Um, and we'll move forward with, with updating the chip and um, thinking about policy change as we go and, and setting a policy agenda. Um, that's a really good, good goal for the chip. So thank you.
Thank you all. Um, any other Before we thoughts? leave, I have a little comment, which is that I came from Berkshire County, and I know about Mombat, and so I really appreciate those references and Angela, Andrea's last name. I so wish That's I was related. I was so wish I was related. <laughs> Maybe I am to Elizabeth Freeman, but um, oh, she what an amazing person and story. Yeah, I used to work for the organization that helped, uh, you know, protect, you know, help uh, put some of the uh, historical interpretation around that. Um, but no, I wish and I was the, related. <laughs> thanks. And, yes. and the exciting thing about all that is that the Sheffield resolves were being formed created at Colonel Ashley's house where she was serving as a slave, that she was providing food for those people. And she overhears this conversation and says, I think that relates to me too. And later on, she gets Mr. Sedgwick from Stockbridge who had office downtown in, in, near Sheffield and, and got him to put that into legislation and she gets her freeman freedom as well as a man by the name of broom and that was the that opened the door for people until the dred scott decision just because somebody overheard something and said gosh i think that relates to me too and i think that's what we've been talking about today just does that relate to you okay now do something about it <laughs> thanks charlie liz did you have a final thought it says a lot about our chip when a 70-something-year-old white man gives us our Black history lesson for the day. <laughs> I, don't, I think it says something good. Yeah. But I'm grateful, Charlie Knight. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Liz, for Thank sharing. Thank you. And thanks, Becky, and everyone for organizing. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay. Benjamin, stay on if you can for a second. Thank I you can. I have a 2.30, but I can hang back a sec. You can kick the otters off, Becky. Yeah. Let me stop.